having that transaction go through was like such an amazing feeling. So there's never a point where I was thinking, oh God, we might lose 15 grand here. 15 grand to me was a chance to find out what if. Like, again, for me to drive a van was really, really cool. Like, <laughs> so after half an hour, I had to turn the website off because there was just, there was just too many sales going through. Right, we completely sold out. Yeah, that year was, that year was incredibly, incredibly tough. I, I wish I could say it was some sort of genius move, right? Where we'd sort of yeah, worked yeah. out what this business plan yeah. is. It, it was nothing like that. Within 30 minutes, we did 30,000 pound in sales. But at this point, this is properly scrappy, right? Oh yeah. I can't describe how manic it was. It, that it was, was everything you, you went to the back for that. Yeah, completely went all in. We're onto something really special here. So in today's video, we're gonna try something new and we're gonna be recording some sort of long form content, which I'm really excited to do. This actually came from this man's idea of our internal podcast. Yeah, that, um, we've got, because we've got so many offices now around the world, we've got like, back in the day when we did a company update, we'd all get together in the cinema and one of us, me, Ben, Steve, Rene, Paul, whoever, we would stand and address the whole nation of Gymshark, which is like 150, 200 people and tell them what was happening now in the company and what our plans are next and whatever. Um, but pretty soon we're gonna have the Denver office open. We've now got 400 employees just here, right? Mm -hmm. um, Mauritius, Hong Kong. So we needed a better way to communicate at scale, basically. So we're in a podcast world now, right? Yeah. So yeah, we, we recorded our first internal podcast last week and it was talking about sort of the initial stages of Gymshark so that everyone worldwide truly understands it. And the feedback has been so positive that we thought, you know, why not? Let's see how it goes on my YouTube channel. We'll put it out there. We'll have the conversation publicly. And hopefully this is something that, you know, goes well. And if you do like it, please don't forget to comment, subscribe, all that stuff. Let us know that you enjoy it so that we can obviously record more. Um, so yeah, it went so well internally. We thought we would give it a go publicly on my YouTube channel. So yeah, here we go. Let's do it. Go on then, is let's talk about the start of Gymshark. Let's discuss. The thing that, the, so the, the story that Ben told me, the, in fact, the first day I met Ben, the story that I heard that really impressed me was um, the first ever event, Body Power. And like, I <coughs> think Expos, more so back in the day, was so, so, so important to the fitness, fitness industry. Mm. I think they've been, you know, quite sadly, I suppose, becoming kind of less relevant. But that being said, for us, they were super relevant, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, if you go back to that first Body Power, we'll not go back even further, right? The first body power that I went to was prior to Gymshark. So Gymshark obviously didn't exist at that point. And to me, it was it was a place that me and my mates went to after school or at whatever, after work, um, just because it was like that cool place where all the sort of big American bodybuilders were coming together in Birmingham, which was just like completely just, it was just something that just didn't happen, right? Weird so. as well that it's Birmingham, well, it happens to be around the corner. I feel like that's strange. You've got yeah. the royalty of the fitness industry in our hometown. I think, well, it, it, looking back, right, at the time it didn't, certainly didn't feel like this, but looking back, I talk about sort of the stars aligning to uh -huh. get Gymshark to where it is. Like you say, the fact that Body Power, the biggest event in the UK, and at the time, albeit it wasn't the biggest in Europe, I think it was the best in terms of like sort of the quality of the, ve of the event from the people attending the, um, the athletes, but also the companies. Yeah, it was it was certainly up there in the world. So, yeah, the fact that that happened 20 minutes away from where I was born and grew up is just. You think that's one of the stars that aligned to make all this happen? Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, that that first body power was nuts. But before even that, like I said, we went as kids. We went just because it was the cool place to go, and and that was the first place for me that I ever really wanted to be involved in fitness. And it was at that place where I thought regardless of how it is, whether it's supplements, whether it's clothing, whether it's through, you know, fitness and competing, whatever it was, I just wanted to be involved in fitness in general. So But when you say when you say that, <coughs> you say you and your mates went there mm. and you walked around and you know all your heroes there and all that stuff. <coughs> Paint the picture for me of you and your mates at that time. How old are you? What are you doing? Is it college? Is it part time jobs? At that point I guess seventeen years old, you typical seventeen year old lad. I think we was at so we was at sick form. Um 17 year, years old, a sick form, massively into the gym. Um, I think to be honest, at, at that point, the gym was literally everything in our lives. So like I said, to have, to be able to be at the epicenter of fitness for it, albeit just for one weekend was, was super cool. So yeah, we just, we were typical, like love the gym. In the summer we would diet, in the, in the winter we would just bulk up and eat a load of food. Following 
You say typical. I think that's typical now, but I think back then, because you and me aren't dissimilar ages, mm. I think back then, being 17 and that obsessed with the gym where you know about sort of cutting and bulking and doing yeah. all that kind of stuff, I think you were definitely at the, the what would you call that, sort of the early adopters of that. I think there's loads of 17 year olds doing that now. Yeah. But I think back then, when I think of me and my group of friends, all we knew was drink a protein shake, go to the gym. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But I think because you had got into Ziz and Greg Plitt and all these guys yeah. super early, you'd had that like, 3DMJ American influence on your sort of training regimes. Yeah, it, it was. It was. It was Ziz in Australia, Greg Plitt, Scott Herman, Scooby, all those sort of guys. Like, yeah, I think you're right. Maybe it was weird, but I remember for me, it was. It was genuinely a case of World of Warcraft or fitness videos, like <laughs> learning how to, you know, do a proper bench press or a squat or a whatever it was. So, yeah, that was a interesting time. But I think because all of my mates did it, and I'm talking like there was a group of at least 10 to 15 of us that would literally have like arms Friday, chest Monday. I think maybe for me it did just feel like a completely normal thing. So you go to you go to Body Power and that's like the mecca of everything that you care about at that time. Yeah, and what you've got to remember is, I think when you look at the industry now and things like stringer vests and, uh, and a lot of the stuff that lifters wear nowadays are so readily available, they weren't as readily available back then. And I think let alone in Birmingham mm -hmm. or in the UK in particular. So mm -hmm. the first time I ever saw a stringer vest that wasn't in a black and white pi picture on Arnold Schwarzenegger or one of the big lifters, was at Body Power. And I remember walking around and sort of picking one up and I think it was a MPC stringer or a Gold's Gym stringer, something like that at the time. And just seeing that in real life was, was nuts. And don't get me wrong, we tried it on and it just completely and utterly drowned us. It was like way too big. But having that American at the time um, influence rock up in Birmingham for a weekend was crazy. So you were going then as just a um, visitor, walking around, doing the whole mm -hmm. get some free supplements, get a string out, all that jazz. Yeah. What was the point where you went? I want to, I want to do something here. So hang on. So yeah, that's a. I just sort of thought of another question for myself there. Did you have Gymshark at this point? No, no, no. So at the time, so I vividly remember having to, and I was so miffed at the time, having to leave all my mates at Body Power early because I had to go and do my shift at Pizza Hut. So. And you're delivering pizza. Yeah, yeah. So at the time there was no gym shark. It was just school in the day or whatever. Pizza in the evening, uh, usually like five till ten. Um, obviously, body power was was a day thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was literally there as a fan and like genuinely just obsessed with the whole fitness industry. Mm -hmm. So gym shark starts. You start drop shipping supplements. I'm guessing this is in between body power events. Yeah. yeah so w so it was body power that wanted me to be or wanted us as a group to be involved in fitness, right? So went away at that point and. Um, found out about Shopify, made this website and the website, because it was a case of, it wasn't, there wasn't like a, a pull in terms of a, any specific direction. It was just, it was almost like the, the image in my head was involvement in the fitness industry and however that looks. Mm -hmm. Obviously got the website up and just drop ship supplements. So filled up the website with all, with all the supplements I could possibly find. Um, they would be shipped from another vendor, someone would order it and it would then obviously ship via the vendor through Gymshark, we'd make a small margin. And mm -hmm. I remember, it took two, it must have took about two months to get the first sale. The first sale was for something called um, USN Hyperbolic Mass, which is like a South African brand. Uh, it was like a weight gainer. Um, and it was 50 quid, and I think we made two pounds profit on that. And just having that transaction, albeit it was nothing right, two quid at the time, having that transaction go through was like such an amazing feeling. It was like nothing I'd ever experienced before. Harley from Shopify talks about that a lot, right at that the moment. That first sale. That first sale, and he says like, I can't remember. There's a super impressive metric which he gave about how many Shopify vendors or you know new entrepreneurs get that feeling per day now, thanks to Shopify of that yeah. first sale. It's really cool, that isn't it? So it's cool that you remember that so much. But the so so it's body power that made you want to get involved in the fitness industry. So you've done that the drop shipping thing. So then, when was the first point you went to body power? having the Gymshark website live selling stuff? So first Body Power I think was a visitor and I think I think it was the second Body Power that I ever went to. At this point Gymshark was live, right? So at this point yep. we were drop shipping supplements and we weren't making a whole lot of revenue. It, we had a Facebook page, it wasn't really doing a fat lot. And I remember being at that show and again, it was just, it was more of a, a gut instinct sort of just a, a feeling of we have to be here next year. So at the show, we was wandering around. And I remember thinking just, we have to be here. So I went up to the place where you book stands. Um, they had like a sort of little booth by the sort of entrance slash mm -hmm. exit. And at the time it was a guy called Ollie Upton that I spoke to and I, I didn't know who he was at the time. Yeah. Um, you know, he's still a mate to this day. And he 
he basically owns the show, co-owned the show, and I just said to him, like, can we have a stand? Like, wh- whatever stand we can get, whatever the cheapest stand and is. And you must have looked like some little ragamuffin oh, yeah, kids at this point to Ollie, right? Scruffy, uh, <laughs> local lad, Drummies. like, hole in our shoe, holes in our shoes sort of thing, just literally just full tracksuit, whatever. And just said, just what, whatever the cheapest stand is, I think the cheapest stand at the time was about three grand. Through building up Gymshark and personal savings and all that, we'd literally been able to save three thousand pounds, which was so that was everything you had. Everything we had, literally yeah. everything. And I remember saying to him, "Right, we'll do this," because yeah. I knew that we had twelve months to pay for it because we was obviously at the show the year before. And just said, "Right, that's it. We'll do it. Sign up for it there and then." And at the time, we signed up for the smallest stand. Now, in the next twelve months, we absolutely grafted. At this point, bought the screen printer, bought the sewing machine, and and handmade the clothes for. The, the following 12 months and at that point because we were hand making the clothes the margin was was so much better right and we were literally it was literally a case of what do we want to wear what 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 do we enjoy what do we like and let's just make it so it was all around hoodies stringers obviously because they just weren't available at the time mm-hmm. more fitted t-shirts uh there was uh, some shorts called like the look shorts um that sort of stuff and we just spent 12 months just hand making product which was which was nuts i, m- I remember actually on the shorts which was really really lucky actually there was a the shorts were actually purchased um abroad uh, purchased in pakistan and there was a guy called tanvir who i got friendly with i'd speak to him quite a lot mm-hmm. and i just said to him like you know we've got these shorts we can't afford to pay you for the shorts but can you just sort of do me a favor and ship us a load because that would really help us sort of build up revenue so that we could pay for the um pay for the uh, floor space at the expo the following year and he did us the favor to be fair to him he sent us the shorts completely free which what a guy I just didn't think would happen. So that was a huge, again, going Big back, to, going back yeah, <laughs> to right and going back to the stars aligning, right? If all these things didn't yeah. happen, if all these sort of pieces didn't fall into place, then we wouldn't be where we are today, I don't think. So yeah, sent them over, uh, we sold them. And to be fair, we'd made the revenue back on the shorts for the cost of what it cost us within a week or so. So sent him the money. He was yep. obviously happy at that yep. point. And then with that money, we could then pay for the stand. And I remember actually calling the guys at Buddy Power and saying, you know we're doing quite well at the moment can we upgrade the size of the stand so we managed to do that and um yeah that year was that year was incredibly incredibly tough i was i was at university at the time um so i do university in the day i do pizza between 5 p.m and t- i think the finished shift closed at 10 but usually you'd end up staying a little bit after just to clean up mm-hmm. um and then sort of do gym shark on the evening but that was a tough year, but it, it certainly didn't feel like at that at the time because it was sort of like it was your passion it was, project. Yeah, it was right? my passion. It didn't. It sounds worse than it was. It was. I wouldn't have had it any other way. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so, so we're well, fast forwarding then uh, up to you, you're making clothes now. A year's passed. But actually, you're going to be exhibiting a body power. Now, the reason I think this topic is such a great one and this story is so good is because what I think kind of happened here is these days you, me, a bunch of other people, we get invited to these events and we get asked to talk about our pioneering uh, retail strategy, right? Or our pioneering influencer marketing strategy. And they say that we were the, one of the earliest brands ever doing influencer marketing, all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. But the reason this, this, this seems like to me, like this little ad hoc thing, which you and your bunch of friends did together, just, you know, as like a passion project, mm-hmm. which sort of birthed and now, you know, uh, notorious retail strategy and influencer marketing sort of as a whole do you know what I mean yeah. because this was the first time you'd ever s- even spoken or s- met any of uh, the, the gym track athletes right yeah so it was at, at this point so going back to what I said earlier we had like our heroes were on YouTube right our heroes weren't anywhere else and you know, growing up it was all around sort of football being a Villa fan mm-hmm. from around here those those were our heroes but as we got into sort of teenage years those heroes sh- shifted onto YouTube and it's now looking back I feel like maybe that wasn't the norm everywhere but mm-hmm. with us it certainly was so heroes matt ogus chris lovado jeff side alan Gabay, lex griffin in manchester those were the people that we were watching on youtube and following on facebook at the time so it was literally a case of we're super proud of this product that we're, we're making and we think it's great so we thought let's get in touch with them and see if they'd like it and you know got in touch with lex he was only in manchester so sent some stuff up to him and then he started giving feedback we were doing skype calls with matt and chris really regularly and just chatting to them and we sort of i guess we just sort of became friends via the internet um and they were feeling about the product they were loving it there was things they didn't like and and at this point the, i don't interrupt but there's there's zero commercialness going on right this is literally just 
some guys on YouTube who are teaching me about how yeah. to train and then some kids in England that are making some stringers and stuff and you're just talking to them about the product. You're not paying them. There's no typical influencer stuff going on yet. No, this, this, this goes back to what I said before. It's a, a case of we just wanted to be involved yeah, yeah. and to be able to speak to our heroes, get feedback to our heroes and have our heroes wearing enough. the product was like, for me, that was like, yeah. that was the aim, right? That yeah. felt amazing. So it was during this period we sort of built the relationship with them. <clears throat> and to be fair, it wasn't until I reckon a few weeks before, at most a month or two before the body power that we got in touch and we said, you know, obviously Lex was easy because it was a short drive down from Manchester, but all the other guys, you know, we had the money to fly them in. So it was like, do you want to fl fly in? We'll cover all the costs, obviously. Um, do you want to come to body power in the UK? And I don't think any of them had been to the UK before. So for them, it was a huge adventure. Free trip to England. Um, so yeah, they all flew in, went down and picked them up in the car. They were sort of like rammed into the back of my car at the time. Um, drove them up to the event. We stayed in like a budget hotel in Birmingham at the time. And um, yeah, we just, we did the event. And, and like you say, there was no plan. There. I, I wish I could say it was some sort of genius move, right? Where we'd sort of yeah, worked yeah. out what this business plan yeah. is. It, it was nothing like that. It was literally a case of following our gut instinct and doing what we thought was cool and right at the time. So like, when you see, uh, there's, a, there's a point I want to stress there, like when anybody who watched our athletes, who's watched our athletes vlogs before would see them flying to our events in, you know, on nice airplanes, staying in really nice hotels and everything's very well planned out and structured and they've got athlete managers and all that kind of stuff. But at this point, this is properly scrappy, right? Oh yeah. Crap flights, stuffing them in the back of mum and dad's car to get them up, <laughs> budget yeah. hotel, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and then even, I mean, and even then, right, like you say, like now it's great because athletes get managed and so on. It was literally a case of, you know, we'll see you at the event because what you got to remember is, so at the time, my brother and my dad helped out. So they stayed back mm -hmm. at the, well, so at the time we had like an old unit yeah. in, uh, in Droitwich and they stayed back there and they sort of looked after any orders that was going out uh, and just made sure everything was good there. So we literally had to do everything. So I borrowed my granddad's van and loaded that up with all the stock, taking it to the event. Um, anyone that's ever been to the NEC and tried to work out how that place works, that's like a, a labyrinth. It's it's, a, it's an absolute nightmare and one minute you're allowed in there and you're not. And I remember sort of almost just driving through the um, entryway and sort of landing it by their loading bays, opening up the van, piling out the boxes and then rushing them into the stand. Um, yeah, it was proper, proper scrappy and it was really hard work. We we had to almost look after the guys and obviously we they were our heroes so we wanted to spend time with them and get to know them. But then we had to help sort of help with the stand. So we didn't actually physically build the stand that was outsourced, but getting things like we, you know, we'd forgot to even get hangers. Like we hadn't thought of this <laughs> because we just didn't, it was just nothing that we'd ever yeah. approached before. That on top of that, just going back as well, it was that initial event that essentially m moved me into my decision of the week before I both left university mm -hmm. and I left Pizza Hut as a job. Oh, so right. that was my, I'm all in now yeah, sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. So I was literally dedicating every single second I had to to Gymshark. You still forgot the hangers. I know, nightmare. <laughs> eh? So um, yeah, it, it was it was absolutely nuts. So we had to bring it all together. And to be fair, we, we on the actual opening day, which was Friday, Friday's a, a trade day. Anyone that's mm. been to an event will know that the first day's a trade day, but it never really is. And then yeah. Saturday, Sunday is where you have the, the main sort of guests. So we were told Friday's a trade day. Um, and I think it opened at nine, I think it was nine or 10. So we thought we had a bit of time. We probably had about half an hour to an hour more work to do. Uh, obviously all the athletes were down there and it was just, you know, there was a couple of us, I think Dan and Craig came down and helped as well. So mm -hmm. I think it was four of us in total. Um, and we were still sort of finishing off the stand. I was carrying a box over and they sort of uh, announced that the show was opening, which to us wasn't a big deal because we didn't really think that many people would would know come who you and are, visit come to the stand. stand. You know, yeah, we were just yeah. we we had a small Facebook page. Instagram wasn't a thing at the time. You know, I think I'm pretty sure Matt Ogus at the time was the biggest athlete, and mm -hmm. he would have been in around twenty thousand YouTube subs, which yeah. by today's standards is obviously not a lot. But at the time he was, and I think he still is, right? Like the boy, particularly in natural bodybuilding, mm -hmm. um, the, the the doors opened, and I was carrying the box obviously towards the stand, and then the entry is was behind our stand and. What I can only describe as a flood of people, like literally, it was like a flood of people just piled onto the gym shot stand. And I'm sort of carrying boxes, and there was literally hundreds of people surrounding the stand. And I'm having to sort of say, "Excuse me," to try and get them out of the way to get the stock to the stand. And this is on the trade day, not. And the this is on day. the trade day. Yeah, yeah. And I, I have never known anything like it. And to be fair, it was super cool because a lot of the people, you know, a lot of the people were there because we we launched the Lux track suit at this event. So I think a lot of people wanted to see that. 
a lot of people just wanted to come and have a chat, which was super cool. And I remember just speaking to people and we, you know, they were saying, oh, where are you lifting tonight? And we went down to, to Ironworks after. So it was a super cool experience, but it was, it was, a, it was in that, and albeit at the time you have very little time to think because it is just, I can't describe how manic it was. It was just 10 hours of constant just work, making sure everyone's okay. Um, you know, restocking the yeah. shelves, going back to this. We sort of had stocking boxes um, around the back. It was just completely and utterly nonstop. And I think looking back, I'd say that was one of the most incredible and pivotal times in Gymshark history. And, and to be honest, it was one of the most surprising because you just do not expect anything. Like at the time we were getting a handful of sales a day on the website. Like I said, the few thousand followers on Facebook, it, it was nothing huge, but it was at that moment we went, I sort of, I've genuinely felt like we were at the epicenter of, of the fitness industry and to feel like that in your sort of hometown is absolutely crazy. So I know why I think that happened, mm. but I'm interested to hear why you think that happened. And I want to sort of, I want to also spell out to those who don't know the fitness industry that at this point, nobody else has done the influencer thing at an event, have they really yet? You had a load of sort of... If you're not in fitness. You got, yeah, you got the IFBB dudes or the competition winners who mm. had won some great you know, accolades on stage for their physique and stuff, but they weren't really on, in, on uh, YouTube or Facebook or whatever else, right? So you're taking a room full of sort of, uh, what would you call it, sort of traditional achievers in that world. <coughs> you're sticking some YouTubers in there who were competing on some, like they wouldn't mm. mind me saying, these lower level shows, right? Yet there's a stampede past all those guys to get to your guys, right? Well, to be fair, there was this weird thing of at the time you were either a competing bodybuilder or you were like a social media sort of person. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, like, you know, the, the initial group that came over, Alan, Jeff, Matt, Chris and Lex, they were like massive, massive pioneers in what they did. They were the first people that sort of really did that whole fitness social media thing. That, this thing that right now is so big, right? I think even like from a now, from a from where I sit, I look at YouTube and online and you see some, I, I see three really distinct communities, right? So you see like makeup and beauty, gaming and fitness. Like mm -hmm. when I look online, those yeah. communities are, you know, the most sort of powerful communities. And that's where you see people really sort of come together. Yeah. The, these individuals certainly started that. And I felt like we, we just sort of happened to be there for to that. To harness that, that kind was, of thing. That was super cool. So in your opinion then, were all those people rushing in to get to Gymshark or were they rushing in to get to the to, to the Matt Ogus and the Jeff side and whatever? I'd say mainly those guys, right? But I do think it was a bit of both because I think what we offered was like a central place where like-minded people yeah. could come together, albeit it was by no means planned and it was by no means a conscious effort. I think that's what happened. I think uh, our, our constant drive, and I think it's to this, to this day, right, was just to create the things, whether it's a product or an event, create the things that we would want to wear, do, or go to. Mm -hmm. And I think we inadvertently did that. And, and by doing that, I think like-minded people similar to ourselves all sort of resonated with that and came together. And that was cool. And I think, like I said, that the fact that people came to the stand, they, you know, they bought stuff, they spent mm -hmm. time with the athletes. And the fact there was a massive group of us that went to Ironworks after was, was cool. And it's, 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 for me, that's a wicked parallel because it, although people would never normally make this comparison, I've heard so many founders of sort of skateboard brands say the same thing in streetwear brands, right? Mm. Where they were part of this sort of rebel underground community where skateboarding in its early days was seen as like crazy kids being pests and whatever else on the street. And they went out and started, you know, Nike and the sports brands didn't really represent what they were about. So they mm. went away using screen printers, started their own sort of streetwear things on Gildan tees or mm. whatever else. And that's then become a parallel journey, right? A hundred percent. But but people would never normally make the comparison, I don't think, between fitness and Gymshark and what they've done. But it's all just, to me, sub-communities that weren't represented by any brands. Yeah. And then a brand came along that was the first person to stand up and go, I represent what you stand for. Do you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Which is what you guys did, which is what I think the skateboard brands did, which is really cool. But I know obviously on your channel there's loads of sort of uh, would-be entrepreneurs or even successful entrepreneurs already in the mm -hmm. right right who are um, either starting something new or whatever else so I want to give some um, I want to give some frame of reference financially at this point so you've dropped three grand on the stand right yeah. right then you upgraded it and that cost you probably an extra two five five, so, so yeah. five grand total and then your stock which we'll, we'll keep that as it's kind of separate and then the uh, getting the athletes over in the hotels and stuff total cost probably a a few grand. I'd say, to be honest, looking back, all in, somewhere in ten to fifteen grand, I would mm -hmm. say. Which, by the way, was like by a clear mile the most we'd ever had. Right. So pizza at the time was paying. It was like four ninety nine, five quid an hour. Mm -hmm. So 
that sort of money was just crazy, right? It was it that was, was everything you had. A, you emptied the bank account for that. Yeah, completely went all in. And but like like I said, what I don't want to come across was there was never this moment of we're going all in. It was a case of this feels right. This is what we want to do. This is what we're passionate about. So let's you know let's go for it. Yeah, yeah. It was a, a sure in your stomach feeling. Mm. You didn't sit there thinking I want to invent this thing called influencer marketing or offline fitness yeah. events or whatever else. It was just what you guys thought was cool almost. And I think and I still think we do do this to this day, right? It's less about the risk of what the the, init, the particular risk that we're taking. So there's never a point where I was thinking, oh god, we might lose fifteen grand here. It's a case of fifteen grand to me was a chance to find out what if. You know what I mean? Like if if this thing goes well, if this is cool, if this is an experience of our lifetime and then it flops and never happens again, to me it was worth every penny. And we were fortunate enough for it to go incredibly well. That's cool. So um, Friday's trade day, what was it like Saturday? Because if that was the, the proper day when it opened, exact same thing again. Yeah, well, so Saturday was just as busy, if not slightly more busy, but it felt much more difficult. And the reason was obviously Friday night, jump back in the van, go back to the warehouse. My dad and brother helped us out in terms of getting more stock in and taking that van back to the NEC and loading the stock up. And so basically had no sleep. So Saturday, it was just go again, albeit I think we were slightly more mentally prepared for what was to come. Um, it was just honestly it was rammed and at this point we just couldn't deal with the amount of people that were coming to the stand so to be fair called up my mates um ash grant dan blackwell who were uh from coventry who we historically went to the event with mm -hmm. um called them up obviously they knew the event i think to be fair they might have been coming anyway but they came and helped us out so dropped everything they were doing that day uh, and helped us out so thank god they came and did that as well um yeah, so between like Dan and Craig skipping their exams, Blackwell and uh, Ash Grant helping us out as well, and my dad and brother in the warehouse, everyone really, really helped us. And if it wasn't for those people helping us, we would have really, really struggled. So, yeah. And as well, there's, 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 there's two things there. There's the other people, the, the other brands that are at the expo, and I'm mm. really excited to hear what they thought of that. But then the other thing is, you only started coming out on YouTube and making yourself sort of known as who you are at Gymshark after like four years, maybe five years of Gymshark, right? Like a couple of yeah. years back. And so I think sort of the world has only known you mm -hmm. as like successful entrepreneur Ben Francis, right? Mm -hmm. But again, I think it's really important to stress that point that 19 year old kid, whatever you were, is that not right? 19 at that point, yeah. 19 year old kid in the van, quick rush back, I'll carry the stock in, all that, all that stuff. Mm. You were properly like, you know, stringy your pants, like rushing around, like to all intents and purposes, like parents or girlfriends or whatnot might think you were, yeah, I don't yeah. know, that sort of typical, what's he doing, go and get a real job kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? Which is so funny when you think about that now, because like I said, the rest of the world knows you're this sort of successful entrepreneur. It was, it was, like I said, it was incredibly tough, but it was what I loved doing, right? It, it was, like, again, for me to drive a van was really, really cool. Like <laughs> when I was a kid, like working with my granddaddy would let me drive the van occasionally yeah. and I loved driving it. So the fact that I got to drive it into the NEC was just sick. And yeah. Do you know what I mean? Everything's like an adventure at that point. Um, everything's like a first, so that's that's super cool. And, and this feels yeah. like a lesson. And people say it, and it sounds like a cliche, but just doing what you love. Everything you've said to me so far as we've been recording this mm -hmm. is just like doing it because I loved it. Speaking to the athletes because I love them. Do you know what I mean? Like wearing the clothes because I, I love the clothes we're making because mm -hmm. I wanted to make them. So although that's a bit of a cliche, I feel like you're the kind of living example of that will eventually work out, right? If you yeah. just do what you love and you care about. 100%. 100%. So then going back to that first point as well, I'm guessing you've got USN there and maybe Optimum Nutrition and some of the really big brands of the fitness yeah. industry who have dropped best part of a hundred grand on just their stand build and their space, mm -hmm. right? And then you've got these like four Brummy kids with a bit of a poxy stand in the corner and all the crowds are rushing over to you. Yeah, and so the thing is because so much was going on during the weekend, we had no idea what was, go what was going on around us. Elsewhere, so the, the yeah. fact that we, we knew the, the, the event, right, because we'd been there prior, so we knew that USM were the biggest and the best. Like mm -hmm. they, they just were, they owned that event every single year. They were they were there on the entry. I think um, you had like Maxi Muscle and sounds like that. Smart Shake was opposite us as well. Yeah. Uh, I think ON and the sort of Glambier own brands were there as well. Um, so. It was so we had no idea what was going on right and we genuinely we just i think you just sort of assume that everything's the same and you assume that every stand is as busy as what we were it wasn't until until after the event and again vividly remember doors closed everything had gone and we would just lay on the floor on the stand i think it was someone from ON actually came over and they were just saying they just said like awesome weekend congrats like how did you do it and we were like Honestly, not even sure ourselves. Not a clue, like <laughs> genuine, and not even a clue in terms of how we how we did this thing, but how we even sort of survived it physically in terms of getting all the work done. So, 
yeah that was, again it was just absolutely nuts and it was it was such a, a special thing to be a part of so there's another little nugget in this story which i really like which will probably bring us to the end but sunday you finish monday go home mm-hmm. sleep recover whatever else and then something else particularly special happened monday night didn't it yeah, yeah so at that point we sort of broke down the stand uh finished sunday so sunday you get the breakdown monday obviously is the, the first day after i think everyone sort of started to head off home and then monday night i was just literally sat on, on my own in the living room it was it must have been about midnight just watching telly or whatever and over the weekend we turned all the stock off because again everything was sort of made to order at the time it was printed it was sewed and so on so it was a case of we don't want too many orders going out um the Lux track suit had obviously been announced at the event and it mm-hmm. had been sold at the event, but that had never gone online. We had a few left, so I put them on the website, did a post on Facebook, thought nothing of it, and um, announced that the Lux track suit was live, and so were stringers, t-shirts, hoodies, and so on, were also put on. And within that half an hour, like, I think because this this picture, I think because this whole thing with the Lux track suit in particular and Gymshark had gone viral, and this had gone viral globally, by the way, and we had no idea that this would happen, in the first 30 minutes of turning the website on, we did more sales, it was like, than in the entire history of Gymshark. Like, from a financial perspective. Minutes. Yeah, in the first half an hour. So after half an hour, I had to turn the website off because there was just there was just too many sales going through. Right, We completely sold out. To put things into perspective, prior to the event, we were selling, I would, I would estimate, between three and 500 pound revenue a day, which was, you know, that was great at the mm-hmm. time. After the event, within 30 minutes, we did £30,000 in sales, which was like, again, mind boggling. And I remember sat there, I was literally sat there in the living room on my own that night, just turned the website off. And it was the combination of the event, of going to the gym with everyone, of the, the almost the, the reaction of the sales and the social media reaction afterwards. And it was that night that I remember thinking, I genuinely can see that we're onto something really special here. And yeah, that was, uh, again, uh, just an incredibly memorable point in my life. That feels like the perfect place to end it then, to be honest. 500, 500 pounds, three to 500 pounds a day in sales to 30 grand. You know you're on something then, don't you? 